Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Department of History and Archaeology, UWI Mona's Virtual Lectures in Cape History. I'm Dr. Julian Cresser of the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica, Jamaica Memory Bank, and I will be your host today. And we at the ACIG are very happy to be partnering with the Department of History and Archaeology um, in putting on this virtual lecture series. As some of you might know, every year the Department of History and Archaeology hosts a series of lectures for students preparing for Cape history. This year, because of the challenges of this COVID-19 pandemic, we've decided to put the series online, and we're very happy that you could join us today. Um, over the course of the next two hours, we'll be having three lectures to help students prepare for their exams in Cape history. The first will look on decolonization in Africa, spe specifically Ghana, and that will be presented by Dr. Enrique Okenbe. Um, that will be followed by a discussion on the historical justification for CARICOM's demands for reparatory justice. And our presenter will be Professor Vereen Shepard. Finally, we'll be having a presentation on preparing for exams, essay writing, historical document analysis, multiple choice questions. And our presenter for that final segment will be Dr. Diane McCallum. So again, welcome. We're very happy to have you here. And let me welcome and introduce our first presenter, Dr. Enrique Okenbe, who is the head of the Department of History and Archaeology and lecturer in African history. Dr. Okenbe, welcome. Good day to you. Good day. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cressa. So the CAEP um, History Syllabus Unit 2, Module 2, deals with questions related to international relations, conflict, and liberation. One of the topics that falls under this section is decolonization in Africa, and the syllabus specifically focuses on Ghana, 1957 to 1965. Some of the very specific objectives outlined in the syllabus are that students should be able to explain the concepts of colonization and decolonization, that students should be able to evaluate the strategies of constitutional, constitutional decolonization in India and Africa, and that students should be able to assess the liberation movements in Africa and India. So we are going to be asking you some questions today to help students to prepare themselves to be mm -hmm. able to answer and satisfy these objectives. The middle of the 20th century saw the rise of decolonization movements across the globe. In Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean, these, there were movements within Europe's colonies to end what was, in some cases, centuries of imperial domination um, and to go forward as independent states. Perhaps you could just start us off by providing context. What was European col colonization like in Africa? What exactly were Africans resisting against? Yeah. I think, I think uh, that's an excellent question, because when we look at the decolonization and the struggle for independence across the colonized world, we need to have a, we need to have a sense of what it is that they're resisting uh, against. And there's another thing that it was crucial in, in your question is like after centuries of imperial domination, and I think this is a very relevant question, or a very relevant point for students of, of history in the Caribbean. Uh, because usually uh, we tend to use our own colonial experience as a, as a reference for the rest of our colonial experiences across the world. One of the things that, that we first need to, to clarify when we, when we deal with this topic in, in, in African history is that colonialism in Africa was um, a very short-lived phenomenon. It, uh, it, it's, barely, it's barely like a, a, hundred, uh, a hundred years, uh, in, in some cases even less than, less than that. So if we look at the, the colonial context, uh, some of the things that I like to, to tell the students, not only that this is uh, relatively uh, short, African history is very long. So in this uh, uh, long, very long African history, uh, colonialism just occupy a very uh, sm uh, short portion. Nonetheless, we have to understand the importance of colonialism because, because of the significant changes that it triggered. We cannot understand modern Africa, uh, today's Africa, without the colonial, the colonial experience. But going back to my point of how short-lived this phenomenon is, students have to, to be aware that uh, for the most part, European colonization in Africa did not begin until, until the 1880s. Uh, as they probably know, uh, the Berlin Conference took place between 1884 and 1885, and it's after the Berlin Conference that we, we're going to see like, uh, uh, the colonial uh, uh, takeover of the African continent uh, gaining, gaining speed. 
right? And if you think about decolonization, we're looking at the 1960s, in some cases 1970s, but in, for the most part, uh, most of the African continent became independent in the 1960s. This has given us like about 80, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 90 uh, years of colonial, or colonial domination. But as I said, it's important to understand what is the nature of this uh, colonialism because in a sense we will un better understand why is it that uh, shortly after, Africans started to organize themselves and resist in effective, uh, effectively uh, against colonial domination. And I have some points here just that I want to share with the students. One of the things that, first, uh, that, that we have to understand is that colonialism is about taking uh, political autonomy from, from, from people. The decisions that affect I everybody's life, are, uh, they're no longer in the hands of, of their protagonists, they're, they're in the hands of foreign, foreign rulers. And this is one of the most significant things that we have to understand about colonialism, because that's fundamentally what they are resisting against. At the same time, if we look at the colonial experience in Africa, it's important to understand the nature of the state. One of the things that I keep always, I always tell to my students is that the state, the colonial state, even though it was inspired by the metropolitan state, whether it is the French, the British, the Belgian state, it was comparatively very weak, uh, under-resourced, and those are ideas that we have to, to keep in mind. The colonial economy, what is this colonial economy? Did, did it bring, the moder bring about modernization in Africa? Well, it's a colonial economy in which we see some elements of uh, modern uh, capitalism, but in many ways also we see like uh, very old uh, uh, elements that do not correspond with colonialism. It's, a, it's an exploitative uh, uh, economy and, and, it, and it's an unequal economy as well. And finally, it's also the issue of racism colonial racism in Africa that in some ways also took a very a, a different uh, shape from the one that we find across the Americas. If I can um, show you for example the point that I made earlier this is uh, this is a map of Africa uh, well a, a representation of the map of Africa before the Berlin conference and what we see here is that there's a very limited uh, presence of, of, of Europe in Africa at the time we see like Algeria Senegal by the French we find some territories controlled by the Portuguese on, on, on coastal uh, central uh, Central Africa and, and also a few a, a small uh, British enclaves Sierra Leone and in and around Lagos and obviously the Cape Colony that later on became South Africa. Other than that, the rest of the continent remained independent. Uh, just a few decades later, by 1914, right before World War I, what we see is that Europe has taken control of the entire, of the entire continent, except for those two notable territories, uh, Liberia and especially Ethiopia. Yeah. Right? But if we look at the colonial state, why is it important to understand this? This is, this is fundamentally what Africans are resisting against. They are resisting against the colonial state. The colonial state is the main driver of change in Africa. But to, to bring about change in, in, in Africa during this era, one of the problems that it faced is that it was under-resourced. And as a result of it, what we, what we know is that to compensate for the lack of resources, this state became very authoritarian. Uh, we know that the use of violence was widespread in order to compensate for the lack of resources, uh, human resources as well, but also to compensate for that lack of human resources, what we know is that the, the colonial state in Africa made use of local institutions, the so-called native authority, African chiefs and kings and so on. And of course, as we know, the majority of the population were excluded in, in, the, in the daily uh, administration of the colony. If we look at the, uh, at the economy, uh, some of the important things that we also need to understand because Africans uh, were also dissatisfied with the level of economic transformation uh, that, that took place as a, as a result of uh, colonial takeover. What we know is that colonial economies were designed to complement uh, metropolitan economies. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, African producers and African uh, uh, resources, raw materials were used to complement the uh, manufacturing sectors in, in Europe. One of the things that we can see that how very clearly it happened is the construction of a, of a, a, a transport network, basically roads and, and, and railways that basically were uh, taking the, uh, the raw materials from the interior into the coast and then from there to back to, uh, taken to, to, uh, to Europe. Um, however, I always like to point out this. After World War II, we see an increase in European investment in, in Africa, not just economically, but also in terms of some other uh, uh, services like education and healthcare and so on. And as a result of this economic growth that we see after 1945, 
we see also an increase in the living or an improvement in the living standards. And I think that's an important thing because usually we tend to associate a struggle uh, against colonial oppression mm -hmm. or uh, against op oppressive, uh, oppressive rulers with, the, with, uh, with um, deterioration in economic conditions and things like that. That's not happening. It's actually, it's after World War II that we see an improvement in economic conditions. And yet it is at that point when Africans became uh, better organized. And the last point, uh, sorry, uh, the last point I wanted to, 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 to highlight is the issue of colonial racism. An important thing I said earlier, it's a slightly different from the form that's w that we find here. In, in colonial Africa, Africans are mostly discriminated on the basis of their so-called cultural inferiority. As a result of that, Europeans justify colonial domination, saying that, oh, we are here to civilize Africans. Once they are civilized, we will be able to uh, give them back uh, control over their countries. Right. Right? So um, obviously, some Western-educated Africans realized that that wasn't quite the case, because they were gaining access to this Western education, and yet there were still limited opportunities uh, 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 for them. So we see this time and time again across m uh, most of colonial Africa, including also in, 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 in Ghana or the Gold Coast as it was known, as it was known at the time. Um, one of the things, uh, uh, the final thing I want to make, uh, I want to point out about, uh, about the Gold Coast of Ghana is, or, or, or Ghana is that unlike other territories in Africa, we see an mm -hmm. earlier presence of the Europeans, in this case, the British. Right. Uh, and then as a result of that, we see transformations taking place before than in all the African countries. And I think it, that's an important thing to know because in some ways it, it can also help us to understand why the anti-colonial struggle uh, developed in, the, in Ghana uh, before than in other African colonies. All right, thank you very much. That, that, that gives us a very good overview of, of conditions in West Africa and, and specifically Ghana. But you, you made a point that I want to you know, revisit and spend some more time on. And that is that there, post-1945 is actually a period of economic growth um, mm -hmm. in, in colonies across Africa. Perhaps then you could spend some time explaining why is it that in this period of economic growth, we actually see a rise in this anti-colonial movement. Um, you know, why did Africa's anti-colonial resistance gain strength after 1945? Perhaps, you know, um, in what way does the international context contribute to this? Yeah, um, it's actually, it's a question that in, in, in some ways we always try to, to balance, whether it is like, it, it is this international context, it is the, the, the struggles, the internal struggle, uh, an organization against uh, uh, colonial domination in, in, in Africa, what it is that is happening. Well, and I think it's important to consider always both. And I think the international context is, it, it, it is relevant. Something changed significantly after, after World War II, especially with regards to the colonized world. The colonial powers were mostly Western European uh, uh, powers, right? One of the things that we know is that with uh, the end of World War II, what we see is the, uh, is the, the rise of a new, a new world order, a new international order. And in this new international order, what we see is the, the consolidation of the decline of European hegemony. Mm -hmm. You know, countries like Britain that had been hegemonic, France to a lesser extent, now they're going to become second uh, 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 players in, in this in the inter international arena. Mm -hmm. uh, and of, of course, we see the rise of two superpowers, significantly the United States and the Soviet Union. And these are significant superpowers in the sense that um, even though they also have uh, influence in territories outside their borders, Formally, they are not colonial powers, and formally, they reject colonialism, and that's an important, an important thing. Uh, the other thing is also with this new order, we see the creation of the uh, of the United Nations, right, and the Atlantic Charter. And one of the things, important things about the United Nations is this um, this new principle or this new right to uh, to self determination, which is like uh, at the forefront of the of the Atlantic Charter. So uh, people's rights to self determination. What does that mean with regards to the colonized people? This basically was put in there, having in mind fundamentally the colonized peoples that they had a right to determine their own destiny. So, so yeah. this is this is the, the kind of context that we have, and we see it first um, uh, playing a role in Asia, uh, the Asian liberation, especially in India in the late 1940s. I think it was like a, 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 a game changer because not only in Asia but also across all the parts of the colonized world, where we're going to see that they are going to look at that example and see how some of those strategies became were effective and actually that the struggle against colonial domination was 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 possible. Um, 
and I know another issue that I think we we should um, uh, bear in mind is the growing cooperation among European nations. In some ways, we have to understand we have to understand the the, the scramble for Africa and the colonization of Africa, which takes place at, at a very late stage. If you think about it, mm -hmm. we have to understand it from the perspective of industrialization and growing competition among European, Western European countries. Uh, after World War II, what we see is a turn. It's like basically, uh, well, of course, we had World War I, we had World War II, Europe almost uh, destroyed itself. So the, the way out, out of this and the destruction that, that World War II caused was growing cooperation. This is where we see, start seeing the origins of the European Union. Mm -hmm. If there is growing cooperation among them, they're not competing over, uh, uh, over resources and markets and things like that. And, and colonies in that case, that they, they're not as relevant, as relevant anymore. So internationally, we had this growing rejection. And a point, a final point I would like to make about the international context, uh, which is um, it's also the influence of uh, black nationalism in, in the Americas, uh, fundamentally in the United States and the Caribbean, the English and the French speaking Caribbean. That was a significant uh, uh, influence when it, come, uh, when it comes to the African continent because that's, that's the main source of inspiration for mm -hmm. most uh, African, uh, African nationalists. Mm -hmm. So if we look at it basically from 1945, uh, uh, what we're gonna see is across the entire African continent, uh, different movements becoming uh, uh, organized, mostly led by Western educated Africans who either have been inspired by the readings of black nationalists or they have been inspired by the readings of socialist uh, 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 intellectuals mm -hmm. or in some cases they have been influenced also by the experience of living in Europe and, and enjoying full, full rights in Europe mm -hmm. as opposed to what, what the, the, their situation right. back home. So it is, it, 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 is, it is this that very rapidly is going to lead to the organization of different liberation movements, as I said, mostly uh, organized by, by the elite. But in significant things, what we're going to see is that they're going to follow different strategies. The, the most dominant strategy is the one that will try to, those liberation movements in different African uh, colonies, will try to take advantage of the international context. In a context in which like, colonialism is widely rejected, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're taking advantage of that context in order to put pressure on the colonial rulers. Uh, in some cases, what we also see is the mass protest movement, very effective in Ghana, very effective in Tanzania and so on. And in a few exceptional cases, we also have armed struggle. We have armed struggle, most significantly, uh, especially in the early 1950s in Kenya, mm -hmm. very significantly in Algeria, and later on uh, in, the, in the late 60s and 70s in uh, southern Rhodesia or Zimbabwe. So in a sense, this is the, the how we see the international context favoring uh, some of the developments uh, in, in Africa, Africa. post-World uh, World War II. Um, is the international context enough to explain the rapid success of Ghana's anti-colonial struggle? Um, in other words, why did Ghana gain independence first? Uh, it, it obviously, it explains partly the success, but it's not enough. I, and, I think, and I think we have to understand what is happening in Ghana. Um, because, as I said earlier, one of the significant things about the Ghanaian example is that what we see is that early, early developments of, of a Western educated class, of a middle class, right? We see also the development of a newspaper tradition, and in that sense, like what we see is that from the late, from the late 1800s, from the 1890s, we start seeing ideas circulating. You know, like intellectual ideas, even 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 the writings of of, of, of black nationalists also been been spread uh, through through um, through newspapers and and so on. So there are developments in Ghana that are that are important and help us to explain this. And in fact, in the case of Ghana, we see some significant developments taking place before World War Two. If, if we look at, for example, the 1930s, the 1930s is a very important context. And I think mm -hmm. uh, also from the perspective of the Caribbean, we understand what uh, uh, or why. Uh, we know that there are different sort of riots and protests and so on. Much of it has to do, of course, with the nature of colonial domination, mm -hmm. right? The exclusion or, 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 or the inability of colonized subjects to participate okay. in the political arena. Mm -hmm. But it's also the time of the Great Depression. And th what we see also is a deterioration in economic conditions and, and so on. And this is partly what explains the beginning 
uh, some kind of uh, uh, early protest movement. What we know is that what we know is that these movements uh, uh, in the 1930s they are not demanding they are not demanding independence. independence. They are just demanding improvements in the in the conditions of Africans and and, and so on. But World War II uh, came about, and in that sense, like basically, it put it put uh, uh, the colonial struggle uh, uh, or the anti-colonial struggle uh, uh, in uh, on hold. Well, I think so. But after World War II, efforts to reform to reform colonialism in Ghana re uh, resume. Uh, what we see is that uh, w the, the British felt the pressure. Not only the British felt the, pr uh, felt the pressure of the organized uh, associations and organizations in, in the Gold Coast or Ghana, they also felt the pressure because of the loyalty of Ghanaians and the, uh, the loyalty of, of their colonial subjects. During World War II, basically, the colonized world contributed to the war, war uh, to the war effort, exactly. Mm -hmm. So because of that, there, there, there's, a, there's a sense that, okay, we need to give them back something. In the case of Ghana, what we see is that the creation of the Legislative Council, like we will see in all the colonies uh, uh, shortly after, in 1946. Um, in this Legislative Council, what we see is that there's an African majority, Mm -hmm. But there are two problems with the with the African uh, with the Legislative Council in in, in, in in Ghana. One is that it basically has an advising role. The executive power is still controlled by the uh, G uh, Governor General, right? Mm -hmm. So that that's one main thing. The second problem is that in the case of Ghana, most of the people represented in the well, second problem from the perspective of some Ghanaians is that most of the people represented here are le the native authority, the, tr the traditional mm -hmm. chiefs, and so on. For the Western educated middle class, that is uh, that is a problem. Problem. Yeah, and it's in in this light that we are going to see the formation in 1947 uh, uh, of the United uh, Gold Coast Convention, which is is a movement. It's an elitist movement, movement. In, in some ways. It, it is the middle class, uh, Western educated, but also not just. It's not just about education. It's also people who are um, uh, basically who are business. They, in Ghana, one of the uh, uh, economic uh, developments that took place is the development of a, a prosperous, relatively prosperous um, of, uh, farming class. They're, they're growing cocoa, and, 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 and it is out of this that we will see some of them uh, improving their, their living conditions. And it's going to be this, this middle class uh, that is going to push for further, further reforms. Basically, what they want is the inclusion of the uh, Western educated uh, class in, in the legislative, uh, uh, get rid of the traditional chiefs. That's an important thing, by the way, because after independence, that's going to be a contention between Nkrumah and the chiefs and, and so on. Um, at this point, still, the, 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 they're asking just for reform. Uh, independence is a long-term objective. No, no, uh, it's not seen as viable. But one significant development is that in 1947, at the same time that uh, sh shortly after the uh, United Gold Coast Convention was created, they invited Kwame Nkrumah, who had been an activist, a uh, Pan-Africanist activist in the United States and uh, later on in the, in the UK, they invited him to lead the organization. And that was, that was a game changer. Uh, because in, unlike the rest of uh, or the majority of the members, Nkrumah believed that independence was achievable in the short term. Short term. Only then you could achieve like uh, like uh, uh, like the true transformation that everybody aspired to. So Nkrumah tried to uh, change the mindset of, of of this organization, and after he realized that that was impossible, in 1949 he created the Convention uh, Convention People's Party, and here's what we're going to see now: a significant movement towards towards uh, uh, independence. Independence. Yeah. Um, Important notes about Nkrumah, why the difference between Nkrumah and the, the other members of the United Gold Coast Convention. Nkrumah is also middle class like them, but he has lived overseas for uh, so qu uh, quite some time. He's influenced by socialism, so not really having in mind the interest of the capitalist uh, class and so on. Uh, he has been an uh, activist, and he's influenced by the, uh, the type of uh, social activism of, uh, that he, that he uh, participated in in the United States and the, Uni uh, and the United Kingdom. And, also be and because of that, uh, he believed in social mobilization. Like, true change has to come through the mobilization of the majority of the population, not just be an intellectual or an elite movement and, and so on. And here, as I said, is when we're going to see like a, a full um, a movement towards independence. Uh, and, and what we're going to see is that the Convention People's Party uh, organized a series of strikes and protests in order to force the British 
to concede that independence was uh, in, uh, uh, had to be had to be granted, yeah. and in in a sense, basically, Britain is going to take uh, resolute steps towards that. Initially, 1950, he uh, Britain did not support, did not even envision that uh, uh, independence in the short term was a possibility. Uh, but because of the, uh, the 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 resistance from from uh, Nkrumah and his organization, Nkrumah was arrested, and that was actually a major mistake because after he was arrested, he became uh, a martyr in some. In, in, some, uh, or, or in, in some ways, and, 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 and after he came out of prison, he was uh, 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 an unquestionable, uh, the unquestionable leader of the uh, uh, liberation movement, mm -hmm. and his party gained significant support. The last thing what we need to understand is that once the British, the British accepted that independence was uh, uh, inevitable, uh, they supported some of the uh, policies that uh, uh, Nkrumah became prime minister of, uh, of Ghana. They supported the, his ambitious uh, reform uh, plan. And, but at the same time that we saw that, all the uh, 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 members of the Ghanaian society realized that they needed to, they needed to, uh, to form their own political parties because they, w they did not conform with uh, uh, Nkrumah's uh, ideology mm -hmm. and so on. And this is, that's very significant because what we're going to see is that throughout the 1950s, before independence, what we're going to see is growing competition between different political parties. Uh, uh, but still, despite this competition, by 1957, uh, um, uh, the United uh, the Ghana or the Gold Coast at the time was able to gain independence. Mm -hmm. You have outlined initially in this presentation, you know, a, a lot of the things that Africans, and specifically in this case, Ghanaians were fighting against what they sought to achieve through this decolonization movement, through the struggle for independence. Um, you've also painted a picture a while ago of perhaps different you know, different interest groups who had different ideas about what independence meant and what mm -hmm. they hoped to achieve from independence. Perhaps you could spend some time telling us now about, you know, independent Ghana. Mm -hmm. To what extent were these different hopes, aspirations um, met? And, you know, what are perhaps some of the, the, the conflicts that um, occurred in post-independence Ghana? Yeah. Um, and perhaps, you know, give us an explanation of the path then that Nkrumah's government would have taken. Here's the thing. The developments after 1954 clearly show that G Ghana or the Gold Coast at the time, it was a plural society. Mm -hmm. And it was a plural society at different levels. Even at the, at the level of the middle class, there is pluralism and there is competition and so on. So there, there were different interests, right? Not everybody shared the same interests and there were also different visions, right? But there were, if you like, there were, if you like, uh, some sort of share common vision. And that share common vision is, is using or paraphrasing, paraphrasing uh, Nkrumah. It's, this, it's a political kingdom in which, like the, in which like, uh, the majority of the population will feel represented, the interests will be represented, and fundamentally uh, they will be able to transform the societies, modernize the societies, so all Ghanaians could um, uh, enjoy a uh, um, uh, like a, a better uh, uh, living living standards and, and, and better living standards and, and so on. Um, however, very soon after independence, it became it became uh, uh, clear that that Ghana Nkrumah as the as the leader of, 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 of the new independent country faced very very serious challenges. Politically, uh, the challenges had to do with something that in a democracy should not be a challenge. Uh, but in a young democracy with all the problems that, uh, that, uh, in, in, that we see in, in, in post-independence Ghana, it became a challenge, which is political pluralism. All this diversity of voices, all this diversity of objectives and so on, uh, it became very difficult for uh, Nkrumah to, to negotiate. Uh, Ghana, as an independent country, inherited the flaws and weaknesses of the of of the colony. Like uh, so, if we had said that the economy was an economy that, yeah, there's some significant growth, uh, or, there, or rather, there's some growth after 1945, but that economic growth is not enough, and it's definitely not enough to to provide um, uh, 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 or to meet the needs and expectations of an independent society with all the services that it that are required. That that growth is not enough to to also to bring about economic transformations and so on. Um, but in addition to that, what we know is also the weakness of the state. Uh, the authoritarian and violent state, it, it was still there. Mm 
-hmm. It had not gone anywhere. It was now controlled by Ghanaians, but the, the, the organization, the structure, structure. Was, was still there, right? And that became very clear, that became very clear uh, soon, after, soon after independence. In addition to that, as I said, there's a diversity of the country. Uh, in Jamaica, the, the motto is like, uh, is the out of many one people. And I always say that, just think about what that means. Because it tends to tell you about the diversity of society mm -hmm. and how the leaders after independence, the rulers of the country after independence, they try to bring the nation together to create a common sense of nationhood. But if you translate this to the African context, it is much more complicated. We are not just talking about much bigger countries. Mm -hmm. We're talking about regional divisions. We're talking about uh, ethnic divisions. Mm -hmm. We're talking about religious divisions and so on. So I always said, if it's out of many one people in, in the African context, it's always out of many, 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 <laughs> many, many, right? Uh, and definitely not one people, mm -hmm. no one people. So what we see is that there's ethnic and regional divisions. And, and, and one of the things that the anti-colonial movement failed to do is to, during the struggle against uh, 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 colonial domination, is to pay attention to, to building some sort of common national identity. Uh, only at the, at, in, in, the, in the last few years of the colonial era, Nkrumah tried to do something like that, using Pan-Africanism, an ideology that, of course, he was well familiar with, uh, very familiar with. Mm -hmm. but. The challenge of Pan-Africanism is that it quite didn't quite resonate with the, with the African population. That idea that uh, all Africans, all, all people born in Africa, all people of African descent is just one people by the mere fact, that's a powerful idea in the, in the diaspora. But in 1957, it's, it's a very meaningless idea uh, for most people. Like they don't, they don't, they don't identify with that notion of, of oneness on the basis of color or skin or uh, birthplace in, in the same continent or anything like that. So it it, it fails. So Pan Africanism clashed with the ethnic and the regional diversity, and and what we're gonna see surprisingly or maybe not so surprisingly that as as early as December 1957, uh, um, Nkrumah banned ethnic associations and organizations. So that's the political challenge. But that wasn't enough. We had the economic challenges. And Krumah had very ambitious objectives, uh, and he wanted the modernization of, of the independent country. Of course, you wanted independence to modernize your country, to improve li living conditions, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, to him, true social and economic transformation was the objective. He wanted to expand education, uh, modernize agricultural production, and of course, industrialization. So you become uh, self-reliant rather than independent and, and uh, dependent on imports, imports. Uh, as, as, as it was. And of course, all of that, he, uh, in a, uh, he, he was pursuing this uh, from a Marxist perspective. As I said before, he was a Pan-Africanist, but he was also a Marxist. And it is this Marxism that in, in some ways guided his uh, economic transformation efforts. Um, however, they didn't have the economic resources necessary for the modernization. And of course, we have the opposition of the local middle class. That's another, another problem that, that, that they face. The local middle class, they, are, they, they, they own private property, they are successful, uh, relatively successful capitalists, mm -hmm. and, and so on. And in that sense, they obviously do not, uh, uh, did not support those, those policies by, by uh, Nkrumah. And, uh, and in, in, in addition, what we're also going to see is that there's going to be also opposition from the trade unions. Because uh, over the course of the 1960s, we will see deterioration in economic conditions. And of course, the trade unions representing the, representing the interests of the workers also going to, to protest. In this uh, kind of difficult situation is what we're going to see the worst of, of Nkrumah. Uh, it's very significant, very significant mis mistakes. Uh, uh, to him, political parties, ethnic associations, trade unions, everything that represented pluralism mm -hmm. uh, uh, became an obstacle, an obstacle to, to his vision of what Ghana should be. should be. So then political freedoms restricted from 1957, as we mentioned earlier, but also the political parties, which were the last uh, sort of bastion of these political freedoms, uh, 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 were banned in 1964. And, and Ghana became uh, a single party country and Nkrumah was appointed president for life, for life, if you can believe that, right? Uh, however, these measures did not stop uh, opposition. Um, 
I mentioned earlier the chiefs. The chiefs in Ghana were very powerful. The chiefs in Ghana, the chiefs and kings were very powerful from the days before colonial domination. They obviously were not as powerful as the days of before colonial domination. They lost significant power uh, during the colonial era, but they were still very influential. In terms of the moral authority, very strong moral authority. And they serve as a kind of main force of opposition against, against uh, Nkrumah and his, and his, party, and his uh, policies. So by 1966, uh, the situation was, uh, deteriorated so much so that the military intervened and a coup uh, ousted uh, Nkrumah. And that was the last of Nkrumah as the president of, of Ghana. A few years later, he died in exile. And even though the military at the time said that this was just a temporary measure to restore democracy to, to Ghana, Ghana never saw democracy again until the early 1990s, like it happened in many African countries um, right, um, uh, 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 after, yeah, from the 19, late 1960s, where we see the, the, the decline of democratic regimes in Africa. And it's not until the early 1990s that we see a resurgence of democratic uh, systems in Africa. In Africa. OK. Um, perhaps some final thoughts. Mm -hmm. CXC has highlighted Ghana as a case study for this topic. Um, why Ghana? Is Ghana different from other African countries? In what way is it? What can we learn from the experience of yeah. Ghana? I, I, uh, as, as in many cases, this is a yes and no answer. Yeah. Um, it is different in the sense that it was, it was the vanguard of the, of the, it was at the vanguard of, of the anti-colonial struggle uh, in Africa. In many cases, uh, Nkrumah and Ghana, uh, they led their actions and their success uh, became an icon of, of what could be achieved, and they, they facilitated liberation movements across much of Africa. Uh, so in that sense, uh, that's why perhaps this case is, is more important. And many of the challenges and some of the fa failures of uh, the anti-colonial struggle and the challenges that they face after independence, they're somewhat similar. The, the real lack of, uh, one of the things that I, I like to, to, to say always is that we don't see uh, that these liberation movements gave m too much thought to what colonialism was all about. There was not enough uh, thought given to it and understand what are the conditions that we are inheriting and what are the, the, the sort of challenges that we are also inheriting and so on. Uh, uh, so in that sense, what we see is that uh, Ghana made that mistake and we see similarities in that sense. Obviously, the anti-colonial struggle is also led by an elite of some sort, and that's very common across the African continent. And I think similar to most African countries as well, is that we see the same mistakes also. It's like, sometimes I, I, I think that the speed the speed of li liberation caught many of these leaders unprepared. They started organizing themselves by the late 40s, early 50s in some cases, and within 10 years, mm -hmm. they had achieved independence. Yes. In many cases, they didn't have the organizational, the political experience uh, to, to lead their countries. And the challenges that they faced, there were enormous uh, uh, challenges. There are, they were supposed to be modern countries, or, or they were supposed to be countries, independent countries, operating in a modern, competitive context, and they lack many of the features of the basic features of of modern or uh, of modern countries okay well i think we can leave it there that was dr enrique kenve decolonization in africa the case of ghana dr kenve i think you've gotten the department's virtual lecture series off to a very good start um thank you very much okay thank um, you
Good day and welcome back and welcome to our new viewers um, to the Department of History and Archaeology UWI Mona's virtual lecture series in Cape History. Um, we will be having our second presentation coming up shortly. Um, just before I introduce our second speaker, I'd just like to say that the Department of History and Archaeology is social. In addition to following the department on YouTube, they are also available on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I am Dr. Julian Cresso, Education Outreach Officer at the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica, Jamaica Memory Bank, who is very pleased to be partnering with the Department of History in hosting this lecture series. We too at the ACIJ JMB are social and can be found on Facebook and Twitter. Um, as I expect in the days ahead, when everybody is adjusting and accommodating to this COVID-19 pandemic, we will be finding new ways of interacting with our public. So please um, make sure to check us out on our various social media. Um, for our second presentation, we are very pleased to have with us Professor Vereen Shepard. Um, Prof. Shepard taught me many years ago at the university and no doubt has molded and shaped many of our Caribbean historians. Prof. Shepard is Professor of Social History and currently the Director um, for the Center of Reparation Research, which is housed in the University of the West Indies Regional Headquarters. Prof, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, and it's good to see you. And I'm pleased that I taught you years ago. <laughs> yes, the years have flown, but good to see you. you have good to and see thank you. Thank you. And may I just say that it's a pleasure for the Center for Reparation Research to be partnering with my old department mm -hmm. on you know this journey of including reparation mm -hmm. and being a part of the lecture series. So your topic will be, as you, you, you highlighted a while ago, um, on reparation and the case for reparatory justice in the Caribbean. Um, this falls under Unit 2, Module 3 of the Cape History Syllabus, um, International Relations, Justice, Peace, and Reconciliation. Um, as set out in the syllabus, students should be able to understand the concepts of peace, reconciliation, and reparatory justice, and to be able to explain the historical basis of the Caribbean reparatory justice movement. Prof, I must tell you that in preparation for today's, today's lecture, I went and I dug up my old Caribbean history syllabus, um, started to look through to find you know, what the content was, and I realized that my Cape history syllabus did not have Caribbean reparatory justice on it at all. No. Um, and I found out that this is a fairly recent addition. So perhaps you could tell us what is it exactly that mm -hmm. prompted CXE to include a theme on reparatory justice in the revised syllabus? First of all, at the time it was introduced, it, it was a very topical issue. It was in the public space. It was just after uh, CARICOM had, the CARICOM heads of government had decided that it was time to, you know, make a formal approach to former colonizers for reparation. So it was all over the news. It was being discussed everywhere. And uh, we also realized that a lot of people didn't understand the movement and the justification for it. So I thought, well, it is a way of training and preparing our young people to understand the basis for the move for reparatory justice. And where, where better to place it than in the, the syllabus, the CXC syllabus? Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, let's do it at Cape, the Cape level, because perhaps that's, that's where it has to be for now. For now. So that, that's the justification, um, really, for putting it in. And of course, history, I think, is one of the, the best disciplines mm -hmm. within which to locate this part of the syllabus, this topic in the syllabus, because they study CSEC, mm -hmm. And they will have the grounding in CSEC, and then Cape can be the place to locate it. But history mm -hmm. contains the evidentiary basis. basis. And, and actually, you know, it's, it's essential. It's an essential part of Caribbean history. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it has to be in the syllabus. Syllabus. Um, and I, I think we can, we can all agree with that justification. What exactly are students required? Um, I gave a, a, a very brief um, yes. idea of the, the objectives, but could you maybe expand on what exactly are students mm -hmm. required to study under this particular right. theme? So as you said, it's in Unit 2, International mm -hmm. Relations, Conflict, and Liberation, because the, the part of the, our history is about conflict. conflict. So that's why the unit was, was themed that way mm -hmm. or, or titled that. And then 
Unit 2, Module 3, is where we have international relations, justice, peace, and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, and then we come down to the theme now, which is reconciliation, reparation. reparation. So you move from the unit to the module to the theme. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we are. And in terms of what they are supposed to, to know at the end of all of mm -hmm. this, they will see that you know there are, you have the general objectives and then you have your specific objectives so they are supposed at the end of it of the module the students mm -hmm. are supposed to understand the potential of repartory justice to contribute to peace and reconciliation between states in conflict mm -hmm. and states are in conflict, conflict over this over issue, issue. Yes. and then the specific objective is that students should be able to explain the historical basis of the caribbean repertory justice movement. They have to understand why it's a just demand. Mm -hmm. um, this is, in terms of historiography, uh, fairly... But, uh, sorry, so if, I um, could, if, I could, if I could just say that more specifically, I forgot I should have shown the theme or talked about the, mm -hmm. what the theme is, is uh, what they should study in the theme itself. So in the theme itself, and they have to look at th the concept of repertory justice, they have to understand the concept of reconciliation. Why is it that reparation is a potential? Why does it have the potential to lead to peace and reconciliation? Sure. Then they, must ha they have to understand precedent. So we ask them to look at historical reparation. Mm -hmm. Who got it in the past? Mm -hmm. and, and so um, obviously Haiti. With they mm -hmm. have to, to look at that. Um, the compensation that the planters gave to the the, the Britain gave to the planters mm -hmm. at, at emancipation, that's planter reparation. And then, of course, everyone talks about what the Jews got at the end mm -hmm. of World War II. Two. Um, well, a little later than that, of course, mm -hmm. 1952, but that Germany had to pay up. Mm -hmm. So the Holocaust is talked about, the you know, Jewish Holocaust. It's but a historical precedent. Exactly. And mm -hmm. then, of course, they have to understand the historical justification for why CARICOM is in this movement. movement. So basically, that's what they have to, um, to study. Okay. Um, I know when I certainly um, was in high school and doing history at university, there was much um, written about reparations. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that has changed. Perhaps you could tell us about some of the sources that are now available for students who are doing this topic. Right. Now, the good news is that the Center for Reparation Research in collaboration with the CARICOM Reparation Commission has mm -hmm. just drafted mm -hmm. a booklet for CAPE students on reparation. It will soon be available mm -hmm. and of course students can actually, or teachers can actually send us a note at, and maybe we have to put this up, reparation.research at uwimona.edu.jm. And uh, to find out how they can get a copy, when it will be available, and, and so on. So we have that, where we have, we have done the research. We have looked at all the sources. Well, not mm -hmm. all the sources, but you know, mm -hmm, the key mm -hmm. sources. And we have broken it down for them so, th so that they can say, well, this thesis, ha this, this theme has been dropped on us and we don't have any <laughs> sources. sources. Because, yeah. you know, it's a complaint. Exactly. And so... They can also look at the films and documentaries. They're mm -hmm. all over YouTube. Mm -hmm. There's one called The Empire Pays Back mm -hmm. that they could look at and <laughs> The Old Corruption. <laughs> so, yes, so that one. So, and more importantly, remember I mentioned that the CSEC syllabus contains the evidentiary basis. basis. They can review mm -hmm. their CSEC history because everything is there that they need to know about conquest, colonization, the the trafficking, and colonialism, exactly, trafficking, and yeah. all of that, yes. Mm -hmm. And then, but if they want specific texts at this time before mm -hmm. the booklet becomes available to them, mm -hmm. I've put up on the screen Britain's Black Debt by Professor Hilary Beckles, who mm -hmm. is the chair of the CARICOM Reparation Mission. Commission. Right and the vice chancellor of the, of, of the University of the West Indies, and of course a historian, a mm -hmm. top historian. And then, but before that, there was the debt, and uh, also a book that the Jamaica Bicentennial Committee had, you know, done. Mm -hmm. um, Jamaica and the debate over reparation um, for slavery. So those are things that they can look at. Okay, so that's certainly adequate material. I think and, so. And that yes. booklet, I am sure, will be a very welcome yes. initiative for yes. Caribbean students. We're, um, we're hoping that perhaps we can put it online. Mm -hmm. You know? Okay, well, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure that would be welcome. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned online, I should just say that I've been monitoring the chat, and we actually have viewers from 
all parts of the Caribbean. It's not mm. just Jamaica today. Excellent. We have people from St. Vincent. We have people from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, welcome to you all, um, and thank you for joining us. Prof. Vereen Shepard is here with us talking about um, the case for reparatory justice in the Caribbean. She's given us a justification why this topic um, has been included on the CAPE syllabus, um, given us an overview of what students are required to study, and talked a bit about the sources available. So let, let us get into the mm. content. Let us get into this question of reparation. Yes. And perhaps just start us off by defining reparation. For some people, this may be a new concept, a new idea. What, what exactly is meant by reparation? It's not so new, though. And uh, in fact, <laughs> students always say um, uh, the, the simplest definition mm -hmm. is to, it's a, well, it's from a Latin word meaning repair, right? Mm -hmm. uh, repair. So it really means redressing a wrong which has been done. And sometimes the students, when I, when I go around the island and speak to them, they say, well, miss is like um, somebody mash it all right? <laughs> I, and sometimes they say sorry, sometimes they don't say sorry, mm -hmm. but you always want an apology. Mm -hmm. And if it is bad and you have to go to the hospital, somebody has to pay the bill. Mm -hmm. So they break it down to that level. But really it's to repair a wrong that has mm -hmm. been done. Repair a, a, a crime against humanity. In our case, we're talking about removing the long-term effects and getting an apology and compensation, whether in kind or cash, mm -hmm. for a wrong that has been done to Caribbean people. And I think we could perhaps go a little further to talk about, well, before we come to the justification, we can talk about really the, the fact that harm was done to our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Because people Great say, harm. well, um, you know, I, I didn't suffer that way. Mm -hmm. Actually, we are experiencing the legacies, you know? But in the simplest, simplest definition, mm -hmm. repairing a great wrong that was done. And in, our, in, the, in the case of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. the harm that was done by the, what we call the Ma'afa or the Ma'angamizi, new mm -hmm. words for the students, but really it's, it, we can call it the African Holocaust. The African Holocaust. Yes. Yeah. What's the justification for this demand? You spoke about students doing the CXC um, syllabus and mm -hmm. learning about uh, transatlantic slavery, learning about the experiences of slavery and colonialism. Um, the evidentiary basis is the yes. phrase that you use. Talk to us a bit, yes. a bit about that justification for this demand yes. for reparation? Well, first of all, I think we should understand that this is not unique to people of African descent or African people. Mm -hmm. If we go back to 1492, we will recall that there was an indigenous holocaust. There mm -hmm. was indigenous genocide. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the, the wrong that was done through conquest and colonization to the indigenous people. Now, I know that some writers talk about diseases, the, pan the epidemics and mm -hmm. the pandemics, and that that was the reason for the, the demographic disaster. Yeah. But I think we have to also understand, yes, there were diseases to which they had no immunity, mm -hmm. but there was murder, there was just terrorism, mm -hmm. and so the indigenous people's population just declined, you know, within a few years, a mm -hmm. few decades. So it's for that genocide of, uh, against indigenous people mm -hmm. is also for the trafficking in enslaved Africans by so many countries. It's for plantation slavery and the brutality of plantation slavery. It, it is for what happened in the post-slavery period when rights were taken mm -hmm. away. It's for the continuing colonialist ment mentality, the racism and the legacies mm -hmm. of enslavement that, that from, we, from which we are suffering. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, if I should put it up quickly, so it's, it's, it's for what happened, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's what happened to the, to the victims, because mm -hmm. you know, we know that there's a defendant, you know, the victims exist, um, there is no denying what happened. Mm -hmm. Also, the injustice is well documented. No one can hide away from the facts. Fact, yeah. That's justification enough. The, they, they keep saying that, well, it wasn't you. It mm -hmm. was your ancestors. But in international law, there is nothing to stop the descendants Dance. of those victims from claiming on behalf of their ancestors. Mm -hmm. So if we could review genocide against indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. capture, sail and force uh, relocation of African people, chattel enslavement via the what we call the Maangamizi mm -hmm. and uh, forced you know um, indentureship if we, we could talk about that we could go across that as mm -hmm. well and 
we, we have the murder and the harsh punishment, the unjust post-slavery and post-colonial policies. And then we have the way in which European governments benefited, benefited. from the labor of, of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think everyone can see now in this COVID pandemic that we're having, the instability mm -hmm. that poverty and inequality are creating mm -hmm. in societies. And we have evidence that in some communities, it's people of African descent who are dying. Mm -hmm in larger numbers, numbers than other groups. Impacted, so, yeah. of course, we, we need more data. Mm -hmm. For example, what's the demographic profile of that community and so on. Mm -hmm. But the, the slavery, enslavement, did harm, created, you know, health risks for our people, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, diabetes. the centuries of salt mm -hmm. that we were fed. Mm -hmm. All of these have a, a sort of intergenerational transmission. And now what we're seeing is that the poverty that comes from mm -hmm. that because there was no kind of martial plan at the end of emancipation or independence mm -hmm. that's coming back to haunt us of course we are and we're going to see the inequality in how governments are able to give stimulus package and 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 mm -hmm. solve the issues of you know what we call underdevelopment Under, yeah, sure. so so it's um you know it, it created the europeans created the legal framework mm -hmm. within the within which they justified exploitation sure. and plantation slavery. And then another justification is that they refuse compensation. At the moment of emancipation, they compensated the planters mm -hmm. and then refused compensation to those who were, who were the victims. Mm -hmm. And they imposed in the post-slavery period, you know, these harsh measures. Remember the Morant Bay War and other post-slavery um, liberation struggles across the Caribbean. and they have refused to even engage in a discussion. Mm -hmm. And we know that you know, it was a profitable business. The royal family was involved, still living off the riches. And you can see how Britain benefited. Britain earned you know, five million per year from sugar during the peak of the industry. That was the main crop for many um, countries. And over a century alone, um, you can see what Britain made um, equal Five, to two 500 million pounds at the time. Yes. E equivalent equal to, to 2.5 2 trillion, trillion pounds, pounds today. today. So we have information, you know. We, we, we know that they paid the planters and um, it's not 20 million alone mm -hmm. because Professor Beckles has argued that the if you, if you think of the apprenticeship, apprenticeship period, period, which was a scam, by the way, <laughs> um, it, it, was to, it was a negotiated price right. that 20, uh, added 27 million more. Uh, if you factor in, if you if factor the, in. The, 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 the cost or the value of the, the forced labor that was still required right. on the apprenticeship. Right. And we can see that they actually shared out um, this money. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, we know that the, well, Jamaica got, in terms of the Caribbean, Jamaica would have got most of it um, here. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why my, okay, it's going all over the place, but you can <laughs> see here that Jamaica that got most. Jamaica because um, of, yes. got about s just over six uh, million yes, pounds exactly. compensation. Um, based on, because remember, they, they, they added a value to our ancestors. They priced them, you know, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. they were selling Yeah, them. because essentially what is happening here is that planters are being compensated because their property has been taken away That's from right. them. That's right. And, you know, but no recognition of the, the, the trauma, the, the pain, the injustices that have been inflicted mm -hmm. on the enslaved mm -hmm. people. So, so the good thing is that not, not all records have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. Records exist that is helping, and these records are helping us to prove the case mm -hmm. um, for reparation. So students, you know, should, I think they have textbooks which can show them more about the compensation money. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, could you perhaps tell us a bit about the, the, the development of this movement? Um, is the issue for reparatory justice only a Caribbean issue? It's not only a Caribbean issue. And uh, let me tell the students that when, when you think about the resistance activities of our ancestors, mm -hmm. the resistance of indigenous people, they didn't just capitulate mm -hmm. you know, to the colonizers. Mm -hmm. There has been resistance. And I think we have to interpret resistance as, as a means of, a of saying no. We, we, yes. we, this is wrong. Right. We are, we, we, and, and today we're in Jamaica, we're thinking about the war mm -hmm. led by Chief Techi from Ghana mm -hmm. that broke out in 1760, 
in St. Mary. Mary. Today right. is the 260th anniversary. anniversary. And uh, when you think of what our enslaved Africans suffered as a result of saying no to enslavement, we had to mm -hmm. interpret that as a part of the movement, movement. saying no because it is wrong. Because essentially that's what we're saying. Mm -hmm. You have to free us as compensation. Right. I, sorry, just to interject. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I have um, attended debates about reparations and very often the claim is made, well, why are you only making this case? No. But mm -hmm. if understanding what you're saying a while ago, we should really understand that this is a movement that is long standing. Absolutely. That, that has started at the moment at of the oppression. At the moment of capture and, and march to the coast and A demand and for justice relocate. has been Absolutely. And, and, the and resistance for must be understood as part exactly. of that. Exactly. We have the post slavery demand of freed people for mm -hmm. decent wages, decent mm -hmm. work, to the end of the sex typing of jobs, you know, and, and all of that. So, so essentially, we really have had a long, uh, it's a long genealogy. Then we come to the Abuja conference in Nigeria when Abiola and um, Dudley Thompson and Lord Anthony Gifford, they were trying to put it on the African and global agenda. Mm -hmm. Then we have, of course, Rastafari in the 1930s um, pressing for this. We have had the Durban conference, uh, anti-racism conference, and coming forward, we have individual academics and, and politicians who have mm -hmm. always been struggling for this. And it's just in 2013 that heads of government of CARICOM decided that, you know, we have to join this movement. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it has a long genealogy, and it's really, we really have to, to look at all the factors that led um, to to the now. To the, to the, no, now. To the point where are now. Yes. It's just that people are, are being more vocal in, mm -hmm. in different spaces now. But mm -hmm. Rastafari has always been in the vineyard mm -hmm. for long. At the end of this week, we are going to be talking about the Coral Gardens massacre. Mm -hmm. So really, it has come a long way. A long way. And it has been there for a long time. As long as injustice has mm -hmm. existed, the fight for justice has existed. Mm -hmm. for, for justice. As long as injustice has existed, the fight for justice, justice has, has existed. existed yes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do know of some of the activities of the National Council for Reparations, your own center for um, research on reparations. Mm -hmm. um, who are some of the countries that are being targeted, who are okay. seen as liable? Um, and what has their response been so far? Okay, so these are the main countries that we're targeting. Belgium, mm -hmm. Denmark, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, mm -hmm. Portugal, United Kingdom. I don't know if I've left off any, but those are the, the, the main ones. Where even each day we're finding more information mm -hmm. about even ships that were flying flags of countries you wouldn't have thought would have supported that mm -hmm. but after 1807 and after 1838 you find flag ships that belong to other countries but flying for example a spanish ship flying a russian flag you know and 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 ships registered like in odessa so you're mm -hmm. finding out that you know even latvia was trying to colonize tobago so there are many countries involved and um but these are the main ones yes um their response what has the response been like so far cold i would say um denial that reparation is due and um i think it's just a collective mm -hmm. refusal to engage with the caribbean and mm -hmm. other countries that have been pushing for repatriate justice mm -hmm. from this level of the state mm -hmm. However, I think we, many of us know that universities have been stepping forward, mm -hmm. like Glasgow University, University. Um, in the UK, sorry, in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's United Kingdom, mm -hmm. but it's in Scotland. Um, and Jesus College, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, one of the colleges of Cambridge University, University yeah. uh, has put a, a working group in place mm -hmm. to study the issue. Um, Bristol has done that too. And in the United States, we know about Brown University um, mm -hmm. and many of the, you know, the Georgetown, mm -hmm. Harvard, you know, Antigua Barbuda as a case against Harvard Law <laughs> because Isaac Royal was mm -hmm. a planter, made his money in Antigua, Antigua. Barbuda, and then helped to fund Harvard oh, Law School, mm -hmm. establish Harvard mm -hmm. Law School. So while we are going after the states, mm -hmm. we're also saying anyone who benefited, come forward. Right. Confess and make amends. And make amends. And we honor those who are doing so. Yeah. 
Um, I see a question has um, come in from, from our live chat. Mm -hmm. um, and just to say that, you know, we are welcoming questions. So if yes. you do have one. Um, somebody here is asking what, what progress is being made with reparation movements now. Um, you, you just pointed out that the response has been cold. Um, from, so this, from the from, government. From the government has mm -hmm. been called. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so maybe you could talk about some of the strategies we're employing. Um, is there a precedent for our, our Caribbean demand? What, right. what is being done? And so perhaps I'm going we could to go back to, to the progress in a while. But mm -hmm. since you asked about the precedent, mm -hmm. okay, you asked about a response. So here's mm -hmm. one response, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you asked what, what the state, what, what was the response from the state? Mm -hmm. So here is one in um, 2015. But even before that, going back to two th 2007, mm -hmm. during the bicentennial of the, uh, the passing of the British Act to abolish the transatlantic Atlantic trafficking, tr mm -hmm. we had, uh, um, you know, former Prime Minister Blair saying, it's long in the past. Yes, it's no doubt that perhaps Britain was involved and so on. But this is not a, a question that we can engage in now about reparation. Mm -hmm. And he didn't apologize. He said, we kind of regret. Mm -hmm. But here is... Um, former Prime Minister Cameron, Cameron saying the British government does not believe that reparations are the yeah. answer. And he came to Jamaica and had the audacity to say it in, to our faces. In our parliament. And not many people objected. This was a yeah. sad, sad part of it. But um, yes, there's precedent. We know about Haiti. Mm -hmm. France extracted payment from Haiti because they claimed that the Haitian Revolution, which freed enslaved Africans, denied them mm -hmm. of their means of living and therefore um, for loss of their prop quote unquote property mm -hmm. Haiti had to pay so they extracted well they, they they imposed 150 million gold francs they later on reduced it to 90 million mm -hmm. but Haiti had to pay and up to I think maybe down to 1945 46 mm -hmm. so think about that as mm -hmm. recent you know in in in, in historical terms so, and the British planters got money, the Jews got money, and um, we have other examples, you know, <laughs> they even have, uh, <laughs> apologize to the potato farmers who suffered in the 19th century and so on. And we have the Mau Mau case, mm -hmm. though it wasn't a lot, and uh, what happened in that case is that the survivors got, mm -hmm. but they refused to consider reparation for the families of those who died. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a legal issue that we'll have to think about. And the Australian government apologized, mm -hmm. you know, to um, um, some of the, the treatment of the Aborigines. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, historic, we have examples uh, from historic times to, to recent times. So in terms of the progress, right. okay, somebody wants to know about the progress. Well, we have a structure in place in the Caribbean. We have the Car Caribbean the regional, this sort of um, regional structure, the CARICOM Reparation Commission, mm -hmm. which is headed by Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. We have national committees in each territory. And for those who are listening and watching, if your country doesn't have one, ask the government why. Because initially in 2013, 2014, when there was excitement about this by the heads, mm -hmm. national committees were being formed. But I am told that some of them have not been financed, not been reappointed, mm -hmm. and this is a demand. This is what students can do, and teachers, and, and civil society. So we do have the, the structure. We have the core committee executive of the CARICOM uh, Commission. We have national committees, and we have the Center for Reparation Research. And students might recognize some of these um, leaders here, some of these members of the CRC, as we call it. So these are um, Professor Beckles, of course, and um, other members of the commission. That's me here in some long time days. <laughs> yes. So and then um, we have written, CARICOM wrote letters to, mm -hmm. to these heads of government. Some of them wrote back. Mm -hmm. And again, basically to say, well, you know, we are doing other things for you. But loans and grants and so on, mm -hmm. that's not reparation. No. You know, we don't want to be seen as some kind of beggars holding out a bowl. Mm -hmm. We are saying it's a just cause. But so but basically we had asked for a meeting, like a, a, a sort of, you know, negotiating, mm -hmm. come around a table to negotiate and then nobody has agreed to that. So a second round of letters is being um, mm -hmm. prepared. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what, what then are some of the main <coughs> strategies being used? Um, 
perhaps you could elaborate on the, the 10-point yes. action plan. Okay, so let's go to the 10-point action plan because it's, it's kind of the negotiating strategy, right? So we're asking for apology, or demanding an apology. Mm -hmm. But remember that these are not going to be sequential. In other words, if we never get an apology, it doesn't mean we're not going to go to number two or number three. So, but they can see, so the strategy is a 10-point action plan, and we are asking for Indigenous Peoples Development Program, repatriation for those who desire it, because we know, if you take a poll in the Caribbean today and ask, how many of you want go to go back to Africa? You're not going to get a, a large number of people. Of course, we want to visit, but not many people want to resettle. Then the building of cultural institutions, the attention to the public health crisis, and more importantly, and, and I think these times we are realizing, we need debt right off. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what, what will our economies look like at the end of COVID-19? COVID-19. You know? Mm -hmm. So, and these countries, um, we are entitled to have that happen. Mm -hmm. And we want a development package. We want, in, look at the, the health system in the Caribbean right now. This is a time to look at this development package that the CARICOM Reparation Commission and the heads of government have said, this is where we need to go. Not a financial payout. And Julian, don't wait on your one billion, right? But we are saying, if we negotiate for a development package and everybody will benefit. So mm -hmm. this is where we are going. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps you could then continue to speak about what are some of the benefits that we hope. Um, you, you kind of touched on that a while yes. ago. Um, if there is indeed reparation, um, and, and do you think that reparation will lead to reconciliation? I think it has the potential. I know that there are people who are looking at the South African truth and reconciliation process and the fact that it didn't lead to reparation to say, well, you, why do you want one without the other? In our case, we are saying it has the potential to heal wounds of the past, build better international relations, mm -hmm. and also, you know, it, it could lead to peace and, and reconciliation because we can't, right now we have this dispute. And you know that when a dispute is settled is when you can kind of say we're moving towards reconciliation. So I think it can. And we're already seeing signs because I mentioned the, that universities are coming forward to say we can't live with this history. And in many cases, it's African students, African-American, Caribbean mm -hmm. students in these universities are saying, hey, Look at this history that I'm now understanding. Look at the crest. Look at the monuments that you have. These are all colonizers. These are people who harmed our people. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're we are seeing some 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 signs, but we're hoping that, you know, it will lead to reconciliation. I think it's a benefit, and uh, the development package will help everyone, mm -hmm. because and uh, you know, from 1939, Sir Arthur Lewis was calling for this saying that Britain has a responsibility to return to the region and clean up part of the mess it left. Yeah. And I've, I'm seeing it even in the Moyne Commission report, the evidence given before the Moyne Commission by various people, mm -hmm. like Amy Bailey, mm -hmm. saying, yeah, you, what is this thing about compensation for some and not for others? others. So we have, ha we have that, and so mm -hmm. we're continuing to push for the development package. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly, in, in this push, um, you come across counter arguments. Um, one, of our, one of our viewers has written in to, to ask me to ask you, you know, how do we respond to the statement that African leaders were partners to the European traders yes. in this Atlantic trade? That is something that I hear yes. about very frequently as a right. counter argument. So we could run down um, quickly why there is not uh, you know, total buy-in too long in the past. So that's not the only argument. I'm going to address it, but mm -hmm. it's not the only argument. Too long in the past, you know, there are no victims. And I want to know who am I, you know, standing right here, sitting right here. The descendants cannot claim on behalf of this. So they use all these arguments to mm -hmm. say, you know, the majority of Caribbean people are not in favor, but that's because they don't know the history. And then we come to the one which says Africans um, sold us. So we have this one. No, they were not partners. That's the first thing. They were not partners, and certainly not equal partners. Mm -hmm. But we're not denying that there were some people mm -hmm. in Africa who participated. Mm -hmm. But it does not, what some people are saying is that because there were some people who sold, mm -hmm. and they didn't sold, sell their family, by the way, that's a myth. Mm -hmm. There were so many others who fought against it in Africa. There were so many chiefs mm -hmm. 
who ban their people from doing this. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't come forward. Right. And then remember, Africans had no ships that transported uh, African people. Mm -hmm. They didn't capitalize the enterprise. Mm -hmm. They didn't benefit as a, as a continent from the enterprise. Mm -hmm. They were not the ones who, whose economy blossomed as a result of this. They didn't conceive of it. Mm -hmm. They were not the conceptualizers. So there is no way we can talk about a partnership. And also, remember, there's no international crime without local collaborators. Yeah. Look back in history and look today. Yeah. Narco trafficking, just look at every crime that is going on right now. Even in the Jewish, in the Holocaust, even in, the, in, the, in Germany, mm -hmm. there were people who were collaborating with the Nazis. Mm -hmm. But no one would ever say the Jews don't, don't deserve, deserve compensation that's and right. reparations. So that's what I would say about that. Sure, thank you very much. Um, we do have another question coming in. Um, I'm, I'm not sure you'll be able to answer definitively, but perhaps you could just give a response. And that question is, um, how, do we, how do we calculate or can we put a, a figure on the reparation that the Caribbean island should, should receive? Right, so you know, there are people who have tried, but it is very difficult because first of all, we don't even know the numbers. All numbers are underestimations of the extent of the crime, mm -hmm. you know? So we reject the 10 million and the 12 million, of course. We know it can't have been so low. Mm -hmm. And we even reject the mortality of 2 million, mm -hmm. you know? It, so we don't know. And therefore, we can't, and we can't use the European strategy of assigning a price to our mm -hmm. ancestors to calculate. Uh, and that's why we're going for a development package. But if, but there are people who have made an attempt. The latest attempt was made by a group of actuaries, bankers, and economic historians in the UK, and um, led by, I think, Beckford, um, Dr. Beckford. Mm -hmm. And what they calculated was that if they were to assign a wage, like to a, a, a 17th century worker in the UK, in, the UK, in, in England, mm -hmm. 17th century, what would, what would you have earned had you been paid wages? And they mm -hmm. sort of use wages. What's the interest? Because of over 300 years, you haven't gotten it. Mm -hmm. So what would be the interest? Mm -hmm. Then they look at pain and suffering mm -hmm. and assign something to that. So they have looked at how you would award damages in the courts mm -hmm. and looked at that. And the figure they have come up with is 7.5 trillion British pounds. Pound. And with Jamaica, it, 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 with assigning to each Caribbean territory, mm -hmm. based on how they calculated the compensation money, mm -hmm. with Jamaica getting maybe almost three trillion pounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but we are saying even that is an underestimation, mm -hmm. because the value of wages they used was for the or for the worker in the field. Mm -hmm. They didn't assign a wage for say the artisan, mm -hmm. the housekeeper, the nanny, mm -hmm. the midwives. So it's and, and, and anyway, it's an underestimation. And, and, and I know I'm about to make a point, and I know yes. it's impossible to, yes. to, to, to calculate. But the point, too, is that what we have is for centuries, people are only allowed to be artisans and field slaves, right? What else could they possibly have achieved have become, and have yes. become yes. if given that possibility? Exactly. And, and that is we, but, we, but we are seeing what mm -hmm. some of them became if we track those who went to universities abroad. Mm -hmm. And, and so on. We, we see the, and right now we're seeing the potential of our people, mm -hmm. given the right circumstances, what they could what have become. Yeah. So it's incalculable, mm -hmm. and that's why we're saying, let's just fix up our country, our mm -hmm. region. Right. Fix up our, our region. Mm -hmm. Ensure that everybody has access to quality health care, mm -hmm. quality education, education, without the inequalities and the, and the structural discrimination. Mm -hmm. Remove all those things and clean up your own societies and eliminate racism. If we can do that as partners, then I think we'll build a better world. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. Um, perhaps a final question to you as we wrap up. Um, what has the response been across the Caribbean? Um, is there a general buy-in? Do you find that people are very supportive of this movement? I think it's growing. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. We haven't taken a poll. But what we're doing is ensuring mm -hmm. that if you do take a position that you're not in it and you're not supporting it, it's not because you don't know what happened. So public education and fora like these, that's what we're doing, focusing on education in the schools. And we have a project to go around the, the, the Caribbean. And we have, we have already started to hold seminars mm -hmm. in various places. So public education is where we're at now, so that you can't say, I did, I did not, not know. know.
Prof Shepard, it's very good to have seen you again. Thank you very much for joining us. I am sure our, our viewers from across the Caribbean, both students and teachers, benefited greatly from this presentation. We're very glad that you could have joined us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And um, I just you know, again, thank everybody from across the Caribbean for joining us today. I do have some unfortunate news, and that is that our third presenter, is Dr. Dan McCallum, will not be able to join us today. So for those of you who are hoping to get some tips on exam preparation and dealing with questions and documents, unfortunately, um, Dr. McCallum is not able to join us. Um, nonetheless, I think we had two excellent presentations from Dr. Kenve and Professor Shepard. Um, this is the first such initiative, um, as I said at the beginning, in, in our response to dealing with the, the new conditions of, of, of COVID-19. Um, and as we seek to adjust and still be able to interact with, with students, teachers, people interested in history across the region. Um, a reminder to you that the Department of History and Archaeology is social. Um, they're on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, you can reach them, reach out to them for further information on these topics, for further information on other topics, perhaps pertaining to CAPE and CSEC syllabi. Um, a reminder that I'm from the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica, Jamaica Memory Bank, a uh, division of the Institute of Jamaica. We do outreach sessions. Um, if you are interested in some of the work that we do, perhaps organizing an online presentation of a similar nature, getting information, please get in touch with me at the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica. We too are social on Twitter and Facebook. And of course, there is the Department of History and Archaeology's website, and the ACIJ also has a website. So hopefully we'll be in touch. We'll have more of these sessions interacting, continuing to spread information, continuing to educate, continuing to have discussions about Caribbean history. Again, thank you all very much for joining us today, and have a good one, and stay safe. Take care.